Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwm.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. What yoga hike is is just like it sounds. I mean, we hike and we do a little yoga. It's really a neat opportunity for the ducks that are here. We, we try to keep more water and, and make things better for them while they're here. Even with my own three-year-old son, you know, he loves to look at our Instagram pictures. What's that owl doing? Peekaboo. Peekaboo. He's an island warden for an island off the coast of Port O'Connor, Texas, and it's a rookery island. <laughs> Texas Parks and Wildlife, taking Texans outside for 30 years. It's a chase for recovery. In an effort to boost a struggling mule deer population in West Texas, Texas Parks and Wildlife biologists moved 40 mule deer does to help rebound the population after the drought of the late 1990s. With the help of partners like the El Carmen Land and Conservation Company, biologists relocate the mule deer near Black Gap Wildlife Management Area. It's the first attempt of its kind, the start of a multi-year project. Biologists carefully handle and blindfold a deer to reduce stress, then transport them to where veterinarians check their vitals and make sure the deer are healthy enough to relocate. Then it's off to their new home, 127 miles away. This herd is the first of what biologists hope will be a healthy population of mule deer for years to come. This project was funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife Restoration Program. What yoga hike is is just like it sounds. I mean, we hike and we do a little yoga. The trails are so nice. We do the 2.8 mile Onion Creek Trail. I love how the trails are carved out. They're easy to follow. Any age level can hike. So we do a little warm up to get started. Uh, have people get fully present, focus on why they're here, what they want to do while they're here, do some warm up to get them ready to do a hike. Sometimes we'll stop at a cool place and add some kind of an asana that has some meaning for that area that we're in. We stop at the uh, old oak tree and do a tree pose there.
for me, my practice goes a little bit deeper because I'm actually in the elements instead of elements that have been manufactured to make a studio. Um, so the air is cleaner and the wood is natural and the sunlight feels really good. So what's cool is we can just go on a hike in nature and have people experience nature or the universe or God or whatever. At whatever level, they're ready to experience that for themselves. And then we'll do a final practice, which is usually anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes down by Onion Creek in the picnic area. I want people to feel more connected to nature, not to feel as though there's something separate from nature. They are nature, they're an animal. We just got more sophisticated things. And so doing a hike and doing a little bit of yoga seems to um, narrow that gap. And as we become more aware of that, we treat each other better, we treat nature better. And it's all of this is in preparation for meditation. Ended with meditation and then diving at the uh, upper falls. I think it's an awesome way to start a Saturday morning. We're in and out. We've done a lot of exercise. We've done some yoga and we're out by noon. You can go spend the rest of the time with your family and do all kind of stuff. You know, I get all heavy about all of the esoteric things that can happen, but it's just a fun way to spend the morning. In East Texas, near Palestine, is the Gus Engling Wildlife Management Area. Here, amongst the flooded bottomland hardwood forest, you'll find a winter wonderland for waterfowl. Gus Engling is bottomland hardwoods habitat. It's predominantly uh, oak trees and a lot of it's flooded in the winter time. It's really a neat opportunity for the ducks that are here. We, we try to keep more water and, and make things better for them while they're here. Gus Angling is home to whitetails, woodpeckers, warblers, and of course all kinds of waterfowl. Normally, the ducks we'll see are going to be wood ducks. Wood ducks live here. You'll see mallards, but you also see pintails, ringnecks. So there's quite a diversity of ducks that you'd see here. One of the most special things about these bottomland hardwoods here on Gus Engling is that they're in a very natural state. A lot of your bottomland hardwoods throughout our state and nation have really been logged and, and had tremendous impact by people. While many of the ducks migrate through, there are some wood ducks that live here year round. Wood ducks are really interesting. They're used to these really dense stands of trees that are in the water, so it's really difficult to see them sometimes when they're in their natural habitat. Wood duck numbers are solid now, but several years back, biologists were a bit worried. The wood duck numbers, the population was declining and it caused some concern. And one of the things it brought about was artificial nest boxes. Inside here, we place three to four inches of sawdust, wood shavings or wood chips. And this is what the hen uses to, to cover her eggs while she's laying them. It sort of serves as the natural refrigerator while she's laying eggs. 
We found that placing the boxes right at the edge of the brood habitat, which is what we see here, gives a chance when the ducklings jump, they'll be right there and can go to cover and also uh, be able to start feeding. Current research shows there is sufficient nesting habitat available, and now nest boxes are no longer needed in East Texas. So the wood duck nest boxes were really one of the first attempts, large scale, that people were able to make, and it really has been quite a success story as far as the wood duck goes and their population. There's only a small fraction of original bottomland hardwood forest left in Texas. But thanks to places like Gus Angling, waterfowl will always have a refuge. It's really important for a lot of reasons to have these wild spaces. One of them is so that people can enjoy it. But another important reason is for the animals themselves. They need somewhere that they can call home and that they can stay. There's a lot less wild spaces left, so we want to take good care of it. We could do a 15 second for Instagram, and then we could do a longer one for um, YouTube. The goal of the communications division is to communicate news of Texas Parks and Wildlife out to the public. I manage social media for Texas Parks and Wildlife. I post to our main accounts. We have over 150 local accounts across the state. Whitney has this intuitive clarity for social media that's really quite amazing. She knows the next step before it's even needed and understands what the public is looking for. When I first came on board, um, another person within the agency had started a Facebook page and it had a couple of thousand followers. I took it over and we've grown to over 300,000 followers now. In the meantime, we started an Instagram account, some Twitter accounts, so we've really grown. Social media is a little bit harder than most people think. You have to take um, complicated information. You have to make sure you get all the facts right. Well, let's just... We don't just want to be an online brochure. We try to also post fun things or things that will catch your eye. Social media is definitely not an eight to five job. I'm always kind of keeping an eye on it. A lot of the things that our agency does are things that people are doing on the weekends. So I try to check it during the weekend and see what the comments are, see what people are talking about. In the park alerts that I've been getting, Galveston Island is gonna be not make, making any new reservations. I'll meet with our news team and we'll talk about the upcoming news for the week and how we wanna communicate that on social media. Um, Pollinator Week, which we just discussed, we'll try to do some posts there and hopefully a, a media release will come out that we can link to. Um, Father's Day is a Sunday, so yeah. gotta come up with something for Father's Day. Sometimes it's like trying to drink out of a fire hose. There's so much information coming at me and it's, it's trying to boil that down. One of my challenges is I am speaking as Texas Parks and Wildlife. I have to be an entomologist, a herpetologist, a park ranger. I go to those specialists to get all my information and I have to make sure I'm as accurate as I can be. I also follow all of our accounts, so I try to share information from other accounts as much as I can. Even with my own three-year-old son, you know, he loves to look at our Instagram the pictures and um, seeing the lizards or seeing the birds. What's that owl doing? Peekaboo. Peek People react emotionally to some of the things we post. Sometimes we'll talk about your favorite memories as a kid being outdoors or the best place to see a sunset. Gives you that feeling of, of what it's actually like to do it. Maybe make you want to go out and try it. When people take the time to actually comment on something we post or retweet it or like it, I feel like we've made a little bit of a connection there. And if they think we're cool and fun and exciting, then all the better. It was 30 years ago that the Texas Parks and Wildlife television series, originally known as Made in Texas, got its start. Abe Moore is one of more than 30 producers, photographers, writers, and editors who have contributed to the show since its first broadcast in 1985. Hi, my name is Abe Moore. I'm a producer for Texas Parks and Wildlife Television. I've been doing it for about 12 years now. Um, my favorite story is called Chester's Island. What are we doing? 
waiting on the TV band. They're ready. Tell us what, what we're And it's a story about Chester Smith. He's an island warden for an island off the coast of Port O'Connor, Texas. And it's a rookery island where 13 to 15 species of birds nest there every year. There's brown pelicans, there's reddish egrets, roseated spoonbills. There's like 15 species of birds that are there. And he does everything from work parties. Well, I don't want to give it away. Here, take a look. These are the birds of Sundown Island. And this is Chester Smith, a watcher of sorts for the birds that nest here. Says Spoonbill on his nest now. <laughs> He's still giving that other bird a dirty look. This man-made island in Matagorda Bay is managed by the National Audubon Society. And it's Chester's job to keep an eye on the 18 species of birds that nest here. I have a lot of birds that are beautiful when they're in their mating colors. So one of my favorite is Reddy Secret. Reddy Secret is on the threatened list. Look at the plumes on that great egret. Isn't that beautiful? Those two there, look at there. And they're the most beautiful bird on the island, I think. It's March, spring is here, and the nesting season is underway. We refer to these birds as colonial water birds because they nest in colonies and they're nesting colonies for protection from predators. I always like birds. I've learned quite a lot. It's fun to come out here, see what's going on. Here's some beautiful great egret chicks. You can tell they're great egrets because they have a yellow beak and have green eyeshadow. For 20 years, Chester has worked for Audubon as an island warden. He's a great ambassador for the birds, and he really puts in the extra time and energy and does whatever it takes to get people to understand how important it is that his birds stay healthy. Today, we have a list of honeydews. <laughs> Most of you people have been coming out here on the work day for many years. It's now fall. The birds are gone. But volunteers are here. He's so motivated, you kind of gain that same passion for, for the cause that, that he's working so hard for. We've got a mile of beaches here to clean the trash off. It's fun coming out here and helping Chester out with his project. This is something he cares about very much. Chester's helpers plant some drought-tolerant shrubs. When I first started coming out to this island, the idea was to plant as many little seedlings as you could and hope that a few live. Fertilizer? Okay, yeah, put a bit more in, just a little bit more. Yeah. So we tried a new strategy of taking our money and buying plants that's pretty well established, has a really nice root system, and uh, we're finding out that they do a lot better out here. Very much of it. It's amazing, you come out here six months from now, you won't believe it, they're huge. The birds actually will rest on top of them. They've really become friends. And they're willing to do all those things that I ask them to do to help the birds, so it makes good friendship. Come on, Jester, let's look at this pipe. It's now winter. Andrew Smith from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is out with Chester to see some sand. Tons and tons of sand are being pumped out of the Intracoastal Canal and on to Sundown Island. The higher we get this island, the better it is for the bird's net. There's two sandbars along this area that naturally occur in the bay that tend to build into the Intracoastal. 
What that creates is a shallower channel than what's required for safe navigation. That is stacking up like I like it. But every year we have it set up so that we can get it dredge here and basically move the material over here and use it beneficially on the island. Andrew, I think they're doing a real good job. Right. I like to see the sand piled up high because these birds that nest, they all have a, a better chance of not being destroyed in a high tide. It's going to be great for them. For the brown pelican, sundown is a sanctuary. Listed as an endangered species, a pesticide known as DDT almost wiped them out. That's a pelican nest with only two eggs. When he first came to Audubon at Sundown Island, there were fewer than 10 breeding pairs of brown pelicans on the island. And Chester thought that maybe he could help do something about that. Using donated fence material, Chester built these pelican platforms. And it worked. So well, we watched them. And we was very careful to ask people not get close to them. So year after year, they grew in number. Now we have approaching some years up to 2,000 nesting pairs on that island, and it's been fantastic. This is a federally endangered species that Chester has, we think, almost single-handedly helped bring back to strength on the Texas coast. There's been a major comeback in the pelican population, and I believe it's got to do a lot with my grandfather and, and his passion that he's had for birds. Had Chester not come to Audubon and come to Sundown Island when he had, I'm not sure that there would still be brown pelicans on that part of the coast to talk about. It makes me feel good. It feels like all the work that me and the volunteers have done is we've been successful. The pelicans, when they're hatched, they're gray. They gradually turn white in a few weeks. Then they gradually turn brown. Spring is here once again, and as the birds arrive at sundown for another nesting season, Audubon volunteers and Chester are back as well. I really like to be there in the springtime when the first birds come in and keep track of them. His motives are pure, and he's not doing it for popularity or anything. He just wants to help the birds. He's like a grandfather to the island. <laughs> Chester thinks about retirement, but like the birds that return to sundown, he too has a calling. My plans were to, to retire when I was 85. I've already passed that date, and now I'm trying to make 90. And his calling continues. I've been encouraged to make 100.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwf.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.